Okay, let's look at our water bottle example. And I just walked through this um, before, but we'll walk through it again very quickly. So remember, a bottled water manufacturer on the product label states that each bottle contains 355 milliliters of water. So you work for a government agency that protects consumers by testing product volumes. So you measure the volume that's actually stated on the label to make sure it's actually the, is true, the case. So a sample of 50 bottles is tested. Is there anything we can assume to be true? Well, yes. We assume that the 355 milliliters on the bottle is true. We assume that to be the case. That's our assumption. That's our given. Now, which hypothesis pair seems to be appropriate? Well, I would say that the first one does. So our null is an assumption, and our assumption is that it equals an average of 355 milliliters. And our alternative would be the opposite of that. So this is the one we chose. We set it up like this. So our null is that the volume is 355 milliliters. Therefore, the alternative has to be that it does not equal 355 milliliters. It could be more than that, or it could be less than that. So if the data indicates the bottles are being filled properly, then we fail to reject the null hypothesis. We fail to reject our assumption. So if it comes back that it's actually 355, we have to sort of take our assumption as being the case. So we cannot reject our null hypothesis. We're not saying we have proven the null, just that our assumption has held up. So again, think about it as an assumption that we either reject or fail to reject. If the bottles are being filled properly, then we would fail to reject that null hypothesis. Now, if the data indicates the bottles are not being filled properly, then we would reject the null. We would reject our assumption. So we kind of like put a big X through that null hypothesis. So what we're saying is that our assumption of 355 milliliters has not held up under analysis. We have statistical support for the validity of the alternative hypothesis. So if we take our sample of 50 bottles and it comes back an average of 340 milliliters, well, probably we would say, you know, that's not, that's not 355. It's not even close enough to 355 to account for natural variation. So unfortunately, we would have to reject our null that says it does equal 355. And then we would proceed down to our alternative that says it's not equal to 355. And that's how the null and alternative work. So again, it is all in the wording. And I alluded to this, alluded to this earlier. These are some words I avoid. I avoid the word truth. I avoid the word prove. I avoid the word certain, like a certain conclusion. When it comes to stats, I do not like those words. Because, as I'll say here in a minute, stats is never certain. Stats never proves anything. Stats never says this is true. It's all about probabilities. So instead, I prefer these words. That the data supports something. The data leads us to infer something. The data seems to indicate something. Now, some people might think I'm splitting hairs here. But I really do think the words on the right... Are more appropriate for stats because statistics is never 100% certain but what it does do a good job of is that it states its limitations explicitly so we're always talking about probabilities of this being something or that being something or what have you so I avoid the words on the left and instead try to use the words on the right I don't always succeed but that's what I try to do to always indicate that there is no certainty, there is no absolute truth, there is no absolute proof when we're doing statistics. Okay, so example two, down on the farm. So according to the United States Department of Agriculture, the USDA, in 2006, the average farm size in the state of Texas 
was 2.3 square kilometers. Now, since the decades-long trend has been for farm sizes to increase due to large agribusinesses buying up land and setting up bigger farms, a business analyst wishes to test if the current 2013 farm size is larger than it was in 2006. So let's establish a null and alternative hypothesis. Now, the first question we're going to ask ourselves, what is our assumption? Well, in this case, we assume that there has been no change in farm size since 2006. This is our null hypothesis. Now, you may be thinking right now, well, it says in the problem that the decades-long trend has been for farm sizes to increase. Well, so what? The only information we have, the only given information that we have, is that the average farm size in 20, uh, 2006 was 2.3 square kilometers. So that's our assumption. That's our known. That is our given. So again, that will be our null hypothesis. So, we assume that there has been no change in farm size since 2006. That's our null. Are we testing any preliminary claim or any conjecture? Well, yes. Based on our problem, we wish to see if the farm size has increased since 2006. So, which hypothesis format should we choose? Let's look at the first one. Will our null be an equality and our alternative a non-equality? Well, no, I don't think that's really appropriate for this one because we're talking about increasing. Uh, how about the second one? We wish to see if the farm size has increased since 2006. Well, I think this one is a good choice. So I would pick this one. Well, why is that? So remember, in this case, our preliminary claim, our conjecture, which is the same thing as saying our alternative hypothesis, is that farm size has increased since 2006. Therefore, our null would be that it has remained the same, or in, in some case, maybe even decreased. So our null is that the farm size has remained the same or decreased, and the alternative, the conjecture, the preliminary claim, is that it has increased. So that's why our alternative is the greater than sign. So, how can we set this up? So remember that we wish to see if the farm size has increased since 2006. So if you look down here at our alternative hypothesis, that is an orange as well. So the increased is an orange, and the alternative is an orange. And again, our null is that the farm size has remained the same, or possibly even decreased. And the reason is, that's the opposite of increased. So we have to account for all possibilities. If our alternative says increased, then our null has to be stay the same or decreased. So we can write it out like this. So our null hypothesis is that farm size is less than or equal to 2.3 square kilometers, because that's what we're given in the problem. That's our assumption. Our alternative is that farm size has increased since 2006. So we could go out and collect data for many farms in the state of Texas. And then we could run those statistics. We could do that mean. Now it's going to be one of these two things. Either the farm size has remained the same or even decreased, or farm size has increased. And depending on what we get from our analysis, we will know whether or not to reject or fail to reject our null hypothesis. So if the data indicates that farm size has increased, then we'll have to reject the null. We're going to reject our top assumption there. So our assumption has not held up under analysis. We have statistical support for the validity of the alternative hypothesis. Okay, then our final example, Manchester United. So, during the 2010-2011 English Premier League season, Manchester United home matches had an average attendance of 74,961. Now, a club marketing analyst would like to see if attendance decreased during the most recent season. So, let's establish a null 
and alternative hypothesis for this analysis. So what is our assumption given to us in this problem? We can only assume that the attendance remained the same, or possibly even increased. Because remember, we're looking at the bottom here, he's concerned, or she is concerned, if the attendance decreased. But for now, we can only assume the attendance remained the same. Are we testing some preliminary claim? Well, yes, the marketing analyst wishes to see if attendance has decreased since 2010, 2011. So which hypothesis format should we choose? Well, I would pick this one. And why is that? Well, keep in mind that our assumption has an equality, so they're in the top. And our alternative hypothesis, the conjecture we want to test, is if it's decreased. So if you look down here in the alternative, we have the less than sign. So we can set it up like this. Remember, we're saying if it's decreased, that's our research sort of hypothesis. So that would be our alternative. And our assumption is that it has remained the same or even possibly increased. Now, in this case, I'm not sure it could increase any further because I'm sure those are all sellouts. But I guess it is possible. But we're concerned about decrease. So that's our alternative. So we would set up a hypothesis like this. So our null is that the attendance has increased or remained the same. And our alternative is the opposite of that, that it's decreased. And again, that is the claim or the preliminary conjecture that this analyst wants to test. So again, if the data indicates that attendance has decreased, then we would reject our null. We would reject our assumption that attendance has stayed the same or even increased. We would therefore have to go on to the alternative. So we would say our assumption has not held up under analysis. We have statistical support for the validity of the alternative hypothesis, which is that attendance has in fact decreased since 2010-2011. Okay, just a couple reminders and then we are done. So remember, when trying to formulate a statistical hypothesis, I want you to ask yourself the following question. Am I testing assumption or the status quo that I already know or it exists? Or am I testing a claim, an assertion, or some conjecture beyond what I already know or can know? And they always follow this pattern. The equality sign is always in the null hypothesis, and then the opposite of that is always in the alternative hypothesis. So always think about assumptions. Always think, which will always be in the null. Think about unknown conjectures or unknown claims or assertions or research hypotheses. Those are going to be in the alternative hypothesis. Remember, these are always in opposition to each other. They can not both be true. So a few reminders. All statistical conclusions are made in reference to the null hypothesis. As researchers or analysts, we either reject the null hypothesis or fail to reject the null hypothesis. We do not accept the null. So this is due to the fact that the null hypothesis is assumed to be true. So we either reject or fail to reject our assumption. If we reject the null hypothesis, then we conclude the data supports the alternative hypothesis. So if we do the data for Manchester United and we come up with a average attendance of 68,000, then we would probably reject the null that says it's 74,600 or more. We would reject that, move on to our alternative, which says it's less than that if we had an average attendance of, say, 68,000. However, if we fail to reject the null hypothesis, it does not mean we have proven the null is true. Again, important distinction. Failure to reject the null does not mean we have proven the null is true. We have failed to reject our assumption. And why is that? Because remember from the outset, we assumed it was true from the beginning. Failure to reject the null does not equate to proof about its truth. We're only talking about the null as an assumption to either be held up or knocked down. Okay, so that wraps up our video on the null and alternative hypothesis. 
So again, in the future, I plan on doing some more videos about the null and alternative. And we're going to talk about type 1 and type 2 errors more specifically in our next video. So the null and alternative will come up in future videos. This was, again, just a basic introduction to how they are formulated, how we interpret them, how we talk about them and write about them, and how we formulate them in mathematical equalities or greater than, less than, and things of that nature. And again, I wanted to use some real-world examples so you can see how you pull information out of a problem to set them up. Now, I'm not sure if your stats professor or teacher will be as picky as I am about the language as far as when you talk about proving something or something is true. Again, I prefer words like support or indicate, um, which are a little bit softer words than deterministic words like truth and certainty and proof. So, again, just keep in mind that we live our lives in one great big null hypothesis. Every second of every day, we make null hypotheses about the world around us and about ourselves. And we assume that those are indeed true. So I gave several examples at the front. I won't go into them. But remember, we always assume the world works a certain way. So we proceed through life with those assumptions. Those are our null hypotheses. And of course, when one of them is broken, then we have to proceed to the alternative that something else might be the case. So if I drop a rock in my backyard and it floats in the air and goes up to space, then I will know that my null assumption of gravity has a problem with it. Now, I don't think that's going to happen, but that's sort of an assumption we make, right? Okay, so that wraps up this video. So just for a few reminders, if you're watching this video because you're struggling in a class, stay positive and keep your head up. If you're smart and talented, I know that. Many of the people around you know that, so you should think that as well. If you like the video, please give it a thumbs up, share it with classmates or colleagues, or put it on a playlist that does encourage me to keep making them. Please feel free to follow me here on YouTube, on Twitter, or on LinkedIn. That way when I upload a video, you know about it, and I always like connecting with people who watch my videos online. And finally, just keep in mind the fact that you're on here, trying to learn, trying to improve yourself as a student, or as a business person, that's what really matters. I firmly believe that if you have the right learning process in place, the results will take care of themselves. So, thank you very much for watching. I wish you the best of luck in your studies and in your work, and I look forward to seeing you again next time.